So we are here for what happens after November 3rd, uh, the arts and cultural advocacy needed next. This is part of the Create the Vote uh, program that Mass Creative is doing in partnership with several organizations. Um, we have a Create the Vote steering committee, which, is, which includes Mass Creative, the Theater Offensive, Mass Vote, Arts Boston, the Arts Foundation of Cape Cod, Elevated Thought, Dunamis, the Front Porch Collective, Massachusetts Artist Leaders Coalition, the New England Museum Association, and Stage Source. We also have over a hundred organizational and individual partners who've pledged to create the vote with us, and you'll see in the chat box. Um, links to those if you want to learn more about who has already joined us. Um, and if you want to, you should pledge, you should pledge to create the vote. Um, there's still a lot more to do before election day. Um, and so we are, we're busy thinking and working on that and are looking for more partners. So we're going to start with some greetings from Attorney General Maura Healy. Um, Mass Creative and the Create the Vote Co Steering Committee um, invited Maura Healy to join us today, excuse me, Attorney General Maura Healy to join us today because um, her work to ensure as the, as the Massachusetts people's lawyer to make sure that um, the laws of our state and of our nation are implemented fairly um, and making sure that folks have the resources and the tools and that they need is a part of the advocacy work that um, we pay attention to and think about. So we are delighted to have her join us via video this morning. Good morning. I want to thank Emily Ruddick and Mass Creative for inviting me to be part of today's webinar. And I want to thank all of you for coming together to join in this important discussion. As leaders in the creative community, you're uniquely positioned to engage your audience and help them understand why it's so important to stand up and let their voices be heard. This year more than ever. I'm inspired by the work that so many of you do through Create the Vote to increase civic engagement and help turn out the vote on November 3rd. The public health crisis we're battling right now has disrupted all of our lives in unprecedented ways. It shut down our small businesses, left our workers, students, tenants struggling, and I know it's been particularly disruptive to the arts and culture sector. None have been hit harder than those in our immigrant, black, brown, and low-income communities. This pandemic has exacerbated serious disparities that have existed for a long time. So building more equitable communities starts with acknowledging that there's been a public health crisis for vulnerable communities for decades. We now have a chance as we eventually move forward to build anew in ways that rid us of these inequities and make our communities stronger. That's one of the reasons why it's important that we vote in this election. My office is doing everything it can to ensure that voting rights are protected and that every vote is counted. Across the country, we're seeing efforts to suppress the vote and undermine the integrity of our elections. But we're not gonna let that happen in Massachusetts. We're working hard to ensure safe and secure elections. Voter intimidation is illegal, and we're gonna make people be clear that no voter should be subject to intimidation or harassment, that kind of activity will be prosecuted. I've staffed up my civil rights hotline to address any concerns. Look, we're here to strengthen trust in our democratic process and protect your right to vote. I launched a website, mass.gov protect the vote, that has updated information on how to vote and your voting rights. But we need your help. Make a plan, vote early, be counted. Remember your vote is your right. Use your creativity, your voice, your platform as artists to spread the word and make sure that everyone has the information they need to vote. It's important that everyone engaged in this election stays engaged, especially our young people and communities of color. In the months following the election, a new Congress will be seated and the new two-year legislative session begins here in Massachusetts. We need to keep up the momentum and continue to work together towards a more equitable and inclusive Massachusetts. Arts and culture are key to strengthening our communities. That's why it's so important that you, as leaders in the creative community, are part of this discussion. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna do a recap of the last 22 months. Then we're gonna take a look ahead 
Um, then we're going to talk to our panelists. Um, first, we're going to talk about what role do arts and cultural organizations play in advocacy? And then we're going to talk and think about art as activism and advocacy. Um, and then we're going to talk about some actions that you can take and you can think about taking as we move ahead and think forward. And then we're going to have time for discussion and questions. Um, so we are going to start. I'm just going to share with you as a, as a little sneak preview. So we've got four fantastic panelists today that are joining us. Michael Bobbitt, who's the artistic director of New Repertory Theater. He's waving. Do you want to just give a little hello? You, you can unmute yourself and say hey. Hi, everyone. Do you like my dramatic lighting? It's on purpose. <laughs> it's a day of drama. Here we go. Um, then we also have Nick Capasso, who's the director of the Fitchburg Art Museum. Nick, hey, great to have you here. Thanks for inviting me, Emily. It's good to see everybody. Yeah. We also have Nina Eichner, who is the creative projects manager for the Sunrise Movement, um, who's going to give us a little, is going to talk about her work as an artist and as well as thinking about using art towards other advocacy issues and, and social, um, sorry, social, social justice. So Nina, hi, I'm so glad you're here with us. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. And I believe Elise just joined the, um, joined us. So Elise Patterson is the executive director and founder of, excuse me, of um, Abilities Dance. She's also the executive director of Ballet Rocks. And we're so glad to have Elise here to talk with us as well about her work as a choreographer, a dancer and an artist um, working towards advocacy in the disabil disability community. Elise, hello, good morning, how are you? Or good afternoon, excuse me. Good afternoon. Hey. Okay, so G, are you ready to share your screen? Perfect. So what's happened? A lot has happened. And I think in order for us to think about what's next, let's talk about what's happened. So um, I think in, at Mass Creative, we, uh, and I think in terms of the legislative cycle and the legislative session. So in Massachusetts on the state legislative level, we work in two year legislative sessions. So our, we're currently in the 191st legislative session and that started on January of 2019. And we'll go through to the end of that session and it'll end on December 31st of 2020. Um, and we'll get to what happens after that. But so here's here's what we did, right? So in 2019, in January, of, January of 2019, the 191st session began. Governor Baker submitted his fiscal year 20 proposed budget. Bills were filed, right? So all the legislation that's gonna be taken up during those two sessions, all the bills that might become laws, they had to be filed by a certain date in order to get committee hearings. Um, so those are all filed. Mass Creative worked with uh, Representative Mary Keefe of Worcester and Senator Adam Hines of Pittsfield to file the Massachusetts um, Art, excuse me, the Massachusetts Percent for Art Program Bill, which would create a fund um, to have public art on or nearby all of our state buildings that are to be built or to be significantly renovated. Um, so that's what Mass Creative thought we were gonna be doing for this legislative session, right? That was gonna be our big focus, that, and then also working on increasing the amount of funding for the arts and cultural community. And so the first thing, right? So I mentioned that Governor Baker submitted his budget and then the legislature took it up and through that process, through our collective advocacy, we were able to secure $18 million for the cultural, um, the Massachusetts Cultural Council in the fiscal year 20 budget. And those dollars um, go to support, that's, that's sort of, that's one of the largest pots of public investment for the arts in Massachusetts, right? Um, so that's all of your local cultural council grants, um, all of the programmatic grants. It's also the technical support and the staff support that the Mass Cultural Council provides to the creative community in Massachusetts. The other really important thing of note that happened that I just wanna flag for us is that in November of 2019, the Student Opportunity Act was signed into law. And the Student Opportunity Act um, was a long time coming. And basically what it does 
is it directs a significant amount more of more funding to schools and school districts to close the achievement gap. We already have chapter 70 funding in Massachusetts, which works to close that gap um, with cities and towns who don't have a robust um, a tax base or tax revenue base with which to fund their schools, but this was an additional amount of money and there were very clear, there was a very clear rubric about what schools and school districts had to do in order to receive that money in terms of making plans, identifying ways to close those achievement gaps. And one of the ways to close the achievement gap that was listed in the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's rollout of the Student Opportunity Act was arts education. Um, both in school and then after school and out of school time. But that was a way to make sure that um, young people continued to achieve and continued to, continue to succeed. So that's why that's in this, um, in our timeline. January 2020 occurs, right? So we go through the rest of the year, November, December, then January 2020 happens. And it's the second year of the legislative session. And Baker again submits his fiscal year 21 proposed budget. In that budget, he proposes $16.3 million for the Mass Cultural Council budget. So a little, almost less than $2 million from what was the year before. But friends, we've all been there before, right? Usually the way it works is the uh, governor puts in one number, it's kind of low, then we work with the legislature to get it up both through the House and through the Senate. Um, so again, we were in a place where we were thinking, okay, we're in a great position. We're going to really work. We're going to try to push to $20 million this year, right? Like over time, we're continuing to build that number from where we were in 2010 when it was down to $9 million. Um, and then everything changes, right? So in March of March 10th, Baker declares a COVID-19 state of emergency for Massachusetts. In On March 27th, the CARES Act, which was the third um, federal relief stimulus bill, related, economic stimulus bill related to uh, COVID-19 is signed into law, which provides state and local funding, some state and local funding. It obviously also included supports for the creative community through um, direct grants to the NEA, the NEH, and the IMLS. Um, but and then it also provided us with the Paycheck Protection Program. And for the first time in American history, contract workers, non-W-2 workers had unemployment assistance um, of relief available to them through the pandemic unemployment assistance program. So that was great. And we were, were like, okay, let's charge through this. Um, but it wasn't enough, right? We all know that. The other things to note is that in the midst of all of this, the legislature and the governor decided there was no possible way to do sort of our standard traditional budget process. Um, at, so usually, and we'll go through this in a second, but after the after bake, after the governor releases his budget, then it goes to the House, then it goes to the Senate, then they reconcile the two versions and it gets signed into law or there are some vetoes and there are some overrides. But the reality was is that state revenue projections were so wildly off and that the federal aid that was coming in wasn't enough to meet that delta or that difference that they decided to do interim budget spending plans, right? Right? So in July, they did a one month spending plan. And then in August, they signed a three month spending plan um, that would take us through the end of October. The other thing that happens in August is that there's an economic development bond bill um, is put into conference committee. So this economic development bond bill is um, a method through which money is raised through the sale of bonds. And then the legislature authorizes what the ad administration can spend that money on. So we worked really hard with our partners, with all of you to ensure that the creative community was included in that um, authorization plan. And we'll sort of talk in a minute about what that means. Um, but, that, but that's now in conference committee. So in the last two weeks, we've seen a lot happen. So last week, Governor Baker submitted his revised fiscal year 21 budget. And then this week, Baker announced an economic relief strategy package. Um, and the two things to note, if we can move to the next slide, I'll sort of talk a little bit about this. So in his revised budget, he kept the Mass Cultural Council budget number the same. So it's still at 16.3 million. Frankly, friends, 
I will tell you that I was bracing for a much lower number. So the fact that it's level is a great place. Now we have a place to negotiate from, right, with, this, with the legislature. The other thing that was included in Baker's economic recovery plan was a $10 million grant program for arts and cultural um, organizations to, relieve, to respond to COVID-19. So in this little document, are, are just are some are is all the money that we have been working on and all of our advocacy efforts have resulted in this in terms of relief and support for the creative community. There's that 10 million from the Baker Economic Recovery Plan. There was $2 million included in the COVID-19 spending plan, which was how they were going to spend the CARES money that Massachusetts got. There's $31 million total between the House and the Senate version of that economic development bond bill. There's the 13, uh, sorry, excuse me, 16.3 million um, for the annual operating budget of the Mass Cultural Council doll mass cultural council budget and it's important to note right you all on this call you know that like you're dealing with crisis and then you're also trying to just keep the operations going and so making sure that the operating dollars that are available still exist is really important and then the other thing to note is that in governor baker's fiscal 21 capital budget he included 10 million dollars for the cultural facilities fund in fiscal year 21 and that money is already being is already the that program, that grant program is already in process. So all told, we are talking about $69.3 million in new state funds for the creative sector that we've seen happen since the outbreak of COVID-19 and since the sort of prolonged shutdown of our industry has begun. That is, the, I can draw a really firm, bold line between that $69.3 million and our collective advocacy efforts, our storytelling efforts, the data sharing, the, the additional calls that have been made to legislators and to the administration um, as, as a result of that work. So um, for a brief moment, for these three minutes on a Friday, I think we give ourselves a little pat on the back. Like that's good work that we've done together. Thank you. It only happens because we're doing it together. So if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide, G, I'm gonna give you a preview of what Emily's crystal ball thinks will happen. Now this is informed by a couple of different sources, including conversations that we're having with um, decision makers and with folks in the building, as well as sort of what the, what the normal process would be. So on November 3rd, we have a general election. The, the big headline for this whole conversation is regardless of who wins the presidency and control of DC and our federal government, there is continued advocacy work that we will do together um, after November 3rd. So um, in November or December, depending on how that election falls and who has control of the federal government, we may see a fourth stimulus bill in November or December. Every day, I'm sure you're seeing and alerts that um, Speaker Pelosi and Secretary Mnuchin are trying to negotiate something, and Senate Majority Leader McConnell is is in a you know this triad of negotiations. There's reason to believe that once the election is over, there might be an opportunity to really come to the table and hammer something out. So we'll be looking for that. And there will be opportunities to advocate for that and advocate for inclusion of support for not only the creative and cultural sector, but also um, specifically state and local aid, because we need to have both happen, friends. Then we are going to hopefully see, Governor Baker says he wants to see a fiscal year 21 budget passed in November of 2020. Um, that's really going to be up to how the legislature moves forward, but that's a mile marker we need to look for. And then uh, December of 2020, uh, we will see um, the formal set, the, there's a formal extended session that's going to end on the 31st. And so all bills that are possibly going to be passed and signed into law have to be passed um, by that December 31st deadline. So that economic development bill, we're going to be watching for that. That percent for art program bill, we're going to be watching for that. Um, so those are, that's what's going to happen. 
Then January of 2021, the 192nd legislative session will begin. With the exception of a few seats, for the most part, the legislature will all be returning legislators. Um, there will be a couple of new legislators. Um, for example, the Senate seat in West Springfield is currently going to have a new um, new state senator, and we'll figure out we'll we'll see who wins that race. Um, and so that that's an important mile marker. There will be the presidential inauguration on January 15th. And co coincidentally, that's the same day that is the deadline to file all bills in the Massachusetts legislature. So the so right. So the legislature basically starts on January 1st and 15 days later, they have to have all of their bills filed. This matters because we're going to be thinking about what are the bills that we want to have filed to support a stronger, more inclusive and equitable creative sector, right? So we're going to be working with our partners in the legislature to make sure that they're filing bills and helping them think about bills that they should file in, in pursuit of that. Then in January, Baker will also file the 2020 budget proposal. I want us to brace ourselves here because the, um, the forecasts that I'm hearing about, and I'm sure many of you are hearing about, are basically saying that fiscal year 22 could potentially be a lot worse than fiscal year 21. And so we're going to have to be really on our game and really thinking about how we continue to press the point that a strong connected Massachusetts has at its core a well-supported creative community. Um, and that's gonna include an appropriation from our state budget, our fiscal year 22 state budget. Then, as I mentioned before, we'll go into in April, the House usually debates their version of the budget, then in May, the Senate debates their version, then in June, it'll go into conference committee. We will also um, see any vetoes or overrides on that fiscal year 22 budget. And then in July, we should have the fiscal year 22 budget passed. Um, that's what we hope will happen. Now, it could not happen that way, right? We've already seen how this year has been an unprecedented year, but this is the, the path that we're gonna follow and we're gonna be moving along with, with all of you. So would you mind moving to the next slide, G? Okay, so here are a couple of other things that we're gonna be thinking about and working on. So. As part of um, this whole piece about needing to file bills, Mass Creative is going to do our legislative agenda, agenda setting process. And this is where we're going to look for all of your input. So we decide um, every legislative session, what are the bills or what are the policies that we're going to prioritize in this year and really push for and inform all of you about these efforts and, and work towards collective advocacy towards those goals. And so we're going to give ourselves a couple of days, but um, after the November 3rd election, we're going to move really squarely into that space and thinking about in light of what's happened with COVID, in light of what's happened in general with support for the arts and cultural community in Massachusetts, what are the things that we need to prioritize right now to make sure that Massachusetts is a place where art, culture, and creativity are an expected, valued, and supported everyday part of our lives. The other thing is, is new lawmakers law will be sworn in and those bills will be filed. And then our case making work is going to continue. So in the chat box, you're going to see populate a couple of different things. So the Mass Cultural Council um, just launched a fourth economic impact study uh, for the creative sector, and that's both for organizations and individuals. This is really at the heart of how we've been able to move the needle on a lot of this funding and support. When we're able to give legislators the hard data and the hard reality of what we're up against, it helps them make decisions better. So we need to continue and participate in that survey. That survey is going to be open until the end of the month, but feel free to take it now or at the end of this call. Um, and then uh, the other thing that we are working on is Mass Creative is launching Arts and Culture for Mass, which is going to be a year-long storytelling campaign about the impact and value of arts and culture in Massachusetts and why it is for everyone in lots of different ways. And so you'll see in the chat box a link to that as well. So I promise I've talked more than I should have, and I'm really delighted to have Michael and Nick join us. Um, Michael, Nick, are you there? Yep. 
Hey, hi gentlemen. So I'm really delighted to have you both here um, as leaders of arts and cultural organizations. Um, you have done some really fantastic things. Um, Nick, with your work with the Fitchburg Art Museum, you've done a lot of work in terms of municipal leadership of um, bringing bringing folks together, making sure that folks see how essential art and culture is to revitalizing Fitchburg and working with municipal partners. And then Michael, since your arrival, which I think was in fact only about a year ago, but feels like you've been with us for a lot longer. Forgive me, I've got a, a, a 14 months. It feels, like, it feels like much longer because of the impact that you've made. Um, you really have been thinking, and you and I have been talking a lot about how you build stronger relationships with um, your legislators and the legislators um, who represent your audiences of, of new rep. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to ask my first question really to both of you, and you can decide who answers first, is, um, is the question that's on the screen. And if you don't mind, G, if you'll um, stop sharing your screen for a second so we can just see um, Michael and Nick. So what role do arts and cultural organizations have to play in advocacy? Um, and what, how do you think about that? Um, and what are your responsibilities as leaders of organizations? Well, I think it's everything. I think here in the state, uh, the kinds of support that, that arts organizations get from government is a little bit less than what we see, say, like in Europe. And in places like Europe, you go to France to see the Paris Opera, or you go to London to see the um, Royal Ballet. And so the, the country over there understands that they have to support the arts because that is bringing tourism into the organization, into the country. We had that here, but to a lesser degree. And so my general philosophy is that people like to do business with people they know. And if our legislators don't know us personally, it'll, it'll be hard for them to fight for us when we're looking at all these bills and all these monies that are in the pocket. We still have a lot of advocacy to do. We, um, we need to know who's on the appropriations committee. If those people are in our districts or our jurisdictions, we need to get to know them. Uh, I like to put them all on our opening night lists and then make sure I have, I schedule a meeting with them once a year just to go over kind of what they're doing, what they're working on, what we're working on, making sure we have a relationship. Our organizations have large constituents that vote and donate to their, um, to their campaigns. And so if they become, if they know you and they know you well, they will support you because they know that they're supporting large constituents that go to your organizations. Uh, so bring them to your opening nights, give them a shout out from the stage. They'd like to stand and wave. It's really part of politicking. Um, so we need to work with Emily and need to support her more. When she sends out her emails once a week, do it. Just take the 10 minutes and do it. Um, I also have put in my calendar um, on Mondays at 9.15 to just shoot a note to legislation. Here's what we're doing. Here's what's coming up. Just a, like a two, a two line note, just to keep in touch with them. Um, all that is super important to building those relationships. They, not only will they help with the appropriations and all these bills that we want to be passed into law, but if you have like specific needs, say you need a capital upgrade campaign or you need a new building and you wanna work with some sort of, sort of jurisdiction to see if there's any kind of way that they can help you with the building and give you some sort of amenity projects um, that will help too in your in your building of um, of relationships with them. Monday, New Rep is having a uh, a fundraiser, and I have um, State Senator William Brownsberger um, popping by and and saying how much he loves the arts and how much he's supporting anti racism. I have City Council Member um, Vincent Figarelli um, doing a proclamation. All those things are part of building that relationship. So it's very important that you all take the time, have it be part of your job descriptions and what you do on an annual basis to make sure you're building relationships with your legislation. All right, Nick. Um, I, I am quick to agree with everything that you said, Michael. And we take a similar approach in Fitchburg because we understand um, that, that our legislators, our elected officials, they may care about our organizations and they may care about our programs and the art forms that we represent, but what they really care about 
is the electorate. They really care about voters. They really care about their constituents. And, um, and, and that's what we have to be mindful of um, as cultural organizations that we too are, should be advocating not just for our organizations and our art forms, but even more importantly for the people that we serve. So um, to build on something that Michael was saying about the situation abroad, um, here in this country, we have a system of nonprofit organizations, um, which is unique to the United States of America. Because in this country, there's a whole bunch of work that the electorate has decided that they don't want government to support. And there's a whole bunch of work that the private sector has decided there's not enough profit in. So we have to do all the rest of the work. Um, and we do it for people. We do it to serve people and communities. Um, and we, we have to be not only mindful of that, we have to hardwire that into our organizations. We have to make sure that the communities and people we serve appear and are underlined in our mission statements and our strategic plans. Um, we also have to work externally by aligning what our cultural organizations do with what, our, with the, what the goals and aspirations of our communities and municipalities are and finding ways, finding projects that um, leverage uh, strategic strength, partnership strengths to create new things to cr and to make ourselves almost indispensable in our communities. Um, we have to create strong partnership relationships with people. It's all about people and relationships. And we also have to learn, and this is very hard for people in the arts sometimes, we have to learn to shut up and listen to people to listen to the people what we serve and create things that will help them. And then once we've done all this work, we have to message this relentlessly. Um, we have to message about the people who benefit from our programs, not so much the programs. And there's also a general argument that we can all make, no matter what we're doing, no matter what community we're serving, about our contributions to community health and well being, quality of life, and livability, no matter where we're located. And then the last thing I just want to add here is sometimes um, we, our work has to involve stretching our mission when there's an opportunity or working beyond our mission when there's a crisis. So I'll give you two quick examples. In Fitchburg, we're working with multiple partners in the city, many economic development issues, but primarily um, we're working in partnership to transform three abandoned historic municipal buildings right across the street from the art museum into 68 units of affordable artist live work space. Something museums usually do not get involved with but it's something that's absolutely necessary in our city and they need our help to do this. And then we're, we're, having, we're having multiple intersecting national crises right now. And we were in conversation with one of our major funders about the conditions on the ground in Fitchburg. And we were able, and I'm, I'm very proud to say this is the first public announcement of this this week the Fitchburg Art Museum received a $50,000 grant for food and education support for public school students in Fitchburg, which is one of the most, it's a poor city and it's been very heavily impacted by COVID. Again, these are things that cultural organizations often don't get involved in, but if we really wanna serve our community, we've got to stretch it. A couple more things to add, if I may. Um, the you know I'm still new here, and I'm coming from a state that that um, funded um, aggressively funded the arts. But what I do know is that the amount of money that the arts in Massachusetts is putting back into the budget, into revenues and economic drive, economic driving force, 
is disproportionate to the amount of money we're getting from the state. So there is room for us to grow that pot. I'm so excited about the 69 million. We have to do whatever Emily tells us to do to make sure we get every single dime of that. But in other years, it may go back down to that 16.3. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's way lower than what I think we should be getting based on how much money we're putting back in it. So your advocacy will help. And if I'm not mistaken, Emily, if they hear four or five from, from four or five yep. constituents, they have to move it up the chain. And so if, true, four yeah. Yeah, if four or five of your board members write to the legislation, they have to move it up the chain. That's all it takes to move to move the amount of dollars we might be able to get. So your advocacy, and your time, and your board's times, who might be donors to their fundraising campaigns, are very is very 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 important. Um, thank you, thank you for for both of your comments, and I feel like I have, I have two follow ups, but I want to be mindful of time, and I, I do want to talk about this piece about um, how yes, so the arts and cultural community does bring more dollars into Massachusetts than we're getting out of Massachusetts, right? But there's this other component, which is um, community cohesion, right? So that I think for a really long time, we've always talked about the economic argument. And in this moment in time, when not a lot of people are traveling, not a lot of people are going to their downtowns and to see a play and then going to eat dinner before and you know parking in a garage afterwards. There's still really um, vital work and contributions that the creative sector is making. And I'm thinking about both of your organizations and institutions. And you know, Nick, Nick you already spoke about this a little bit, but Michael, I'd love to hear about how you think about as an artistic leader and a cultural leader, really living in an intersectional advocacy space um, and how you've helped your organization move in that direction. Well, uh, you know, one of the big things I'm pushing right now is anti-racism because I believe anti-racism is an act of love, showing love to people who have never been loved before by this country. And so to me, we are trying to take care of the most marginalized people. So there's nothing that we can do that doesn't take care of the most marginalized people. So that's that's where the intersection of arts and culture comes, arts and life comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, theater has always been an inherently social justice um, um, medium. And so to me, it's just, it's a natural extension of what we should be doing. So there's no separation, but I'm, I'm, I'm advocating for more money so that I can get more <laughs> BIPOC people in the building. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Do we have any questions from um, folks who are participants and our attendees to, for Michael or Nick? Yeah, I think these were all uh, more directed a little bit more generally too, but if any of you have anything to add, I'm curious if we could uh, look at the point that uh, uh, Joanne brought up about individual artists uh, helping with cultural advocacy. I wonder if either of you could speak a little bit about how you've seen uh, individual artists in your community, in your workforce, who have taken this on as a freelancer or as you know somebody who is not necessarily a direct employee, but um, how are you also involving them in the advocacy conversation? Just like I think that advocacy and anti-racism should be taught in every curriculum and every um, community in every school, in high school, all that sort of stuff. I don't know if we teach our artists their power of the power of their voice. And artists, individual artists are voters. They are voters. And so one individual artist writing to their legislation is a good thing. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I wish and hope that we all sort of collaborate on how we get the message and push for these bills to become law and push for these um, this appropriation to come to us and since we're putting so much money in. So individual artists can help so much. Right. In Fitchburg, one of the things we're doing is we're working with a local community development corpor corporation on something they call the Community Stewards Program. And this is a way to train people in our community um, to be organizers, to be activists, to be advocates, in, in various fields, in, uh, in public health and public education and also the arts. So we're kind of home growing as a small legion of um, artists that, local artists, um, whom we're educating and then um, uh, unleashing on the city with, um, you know, to develop their own projects. 
that is fantastic. I'm so excited to hear, to see those seeds that are planted now, how they will grow into much stronger advocacy and, and voice for our sector. Um, one of the things at Mass Creative that we spend a lot of time thinking about is that a, 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 a healthy creative sector has advocacy baked into it. And it's not just one organization that's leading the advocacy charge, but there are many um, individuals and organizers and co collectives and coalitions who are thinking and working and pressing on this. Um, and Karen asks, Nick, what is the name of the leadership project that um, you are working on with the uh, CDC? Okay, so it's called the Community Stewards Program. And it's and the, the name of the CDC that runs it is New View Communities, and you can you can Google that and, and find information about it. Fantastic, fantastic. So so that is fantastic. That is exactly what we need to be working towards: is more advocates um, working in in co coalition and collaboration together. Um, so now I want to move us on, and I actually think this is kind of an okay seg segue. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Nick, for joining us today. It is really works. You need to any email coming from Emily Ruddick. Just do what she says. <laughs> Bye. I'm going to give you your five dollars after the call, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> So we have um, two other panelists. So Elise Patterson, who is the um, executive and artistic director of Abilities Dance and the executive director of Ballet Rocks, and then Nina Eichner, who is the creative projects manager of Sunrise Movement, are here joining us. Um, both of you are practicing artists in your um, specific disciplines. And I just, I, this piece about, I think we, um, I'm, I'm really thinking about the intersectional nature of all of our work at this moment. Um, we've already heard from both Nick and Michael about how they've thought about that and connected the dots for an organization. But for both of you, you have dedicated some of your artistic work towards other issues and activism and advocacy. And so I'd like to, my first question to you two is, um, how did you sort of come to that place? Like, how did you how did you make that connective tissue moment about your your art and your advocacy being um, hand in hand? So, Elise or Nina, whoever would like to start. Go for it, Elise. Oh, Nina. Oh. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll go. Oh. Elise, you go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> No, um, I was going to say that um, it's advocacy has always been in peace since the beginning. Um, I've always felt that, honestly, as a disabled Black woman, I don't have the luxury or the privilege to just make art for art's sake. Um, everything that I create has um, intention and a deeper meaning behind it um, in the hopes that uh, I can further promote intersectional disability rights through the artwork. And then for the disability culture and equity um, in the greater Boston area and beyond, since our company members are located across the country. Um, so the short answer is yes, it has always been in it, it is infused in it. Um, it's seen in various aspects in our um, performances and in our community work. So at least for you, the personal is political. Thank you. That is a, a great way to start this. And Nina, would you mind sharing your perspective on that? Yeah, I would agree. I think that um, art, being an artist is a liberatory practice, but we always want to be thinking about what stories are we telling and what narratives are we lifting up in our art. Um, in my former work at the Summer of Arts Council, running public events and festivals, a lot of what I was thinking about was how do we make space for marginalized artists, for artists from communities that less often get a voice and giving them a public platform where they can share their art and bringing community together through the arts. Um, and now in my work with the Sunrise Movement, I'm thinking even more directly about how art and different artistic practices like making art for actions, video and other narrative um, art can bring our narrative that we're trying to tell into the public and help us build power in the advocacy work we're doing. So like how do those tools, artistic tools, help us build that power um, more directly and more powerfully than if we didn't have that to share our message. 
Thank you. Would you would you mind um, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is I'm sure both of you have been paying attention to this election cycle and have been thinking about your work in response to that. So what are some projects that you recently you've been working on um, that may touch on that or are sort of living into the values that you're talking about in terms of advocacy and art? And why don't we start this time with Nina? Sure. Yeah, so there are definitely a few specific projects that I can't talk about on here because they are directed at politicians. So feel free to go on the Sunrise website and learn more about those specifically. But I do want to talk about how um, the way we do our actions in Sunrise and take action and support young people to take action because Sunrise is a youth climate movement um, is teaching them about how visual strategy is a key part of the action. So if you're taking action in public, um, how are you communicating your message through the slogans on your signs, the colors you're using, your facial expression, your physical body, um, everything helps tell that story and helping people have an aligned narrative because we have volunteer artists, young, young people all over the country who are taking action. How do we all have an aligned visual strategy so that we're building power together? Um, because a lot of times, advocacy organizations or social movements, excuse me, there's a trolley outside my window. Um, um, when we're taking action, sometimes we're not actually building collective power because our messages are not aligned. So leading into the election, one thing we're thinking about is that this is a narrative battle and we want to make sure we're getting out the narrative about the issues we care about. That's helping people feel like their voices are being heard and their voices are being counted. Um, and using the arts is a huge way to do that. Um, and particularly when people are taking action, making sure that the slogans and the messaging are really things that help people get involved and get motivated and don't feel more discouraging because I think a lot of people feel really scared right now and it's hard to be pulled into action and not be frozen by inaction. Um, yeah, and then maybe I can talk a little after we're thinking about Sunrise is really working for um, pushing forward policies around the Green New Deal um, to end climate change. And a lot of that is um, using the arts for public imagination around what that could look like. Annalise, for you, what are you working on right now and thinking about? Yeah, um, I had a production that is just launched this morning um, in collaboration with the Eric Carle Museum, uh, where we created work based on some artwork in their museum, um, but really uh, correlating diverse bodies with works of art um, and traditionally marginalized bodies with works of art so that there is this um, internalized message of welcoming bodies that um, haven't been welcomed um, historically. Uh, we're also collaborating with the University in Sri Lanka and creating virtual production or uh, creating pieces that will be in a virtual production with our company members, dancers and composers and their student dancers and musicians. And all the while talking about equity and um, disability culture in Sri Lanka and America and how we can kind of work together to further increase disability rights internationally. Um, and also developing a Firebird Ballet, which is a reimagined ballet in spring 21 of, uh, uh, led by disabled artists and primarily disabled artists of color um, in leadership uh, or in primary roles so that um, we can reimagine what it means to be a dancer and what does ballet look like. Thank you both. Does, I wanna ask you, um, Elena, do you have a, a question or two that you'd like to ask Nina and Elise? Yeah, I do. I also have a question from Hubert, which I thought maybe both of you could speak to, uh, depending on uh, how you feel your organization fits this, but he asked, uh, uh, just being interested in how strategies for organizing are different for small organizations as compared to larger nonprofits. Um, so I'm not really sure how either of you would identify within that, but I'm just curious if you could kind of speak to that a little bit. Sure. One thing that I talk a lot about with the young people that we support to organize is that you can really do super powerful organizing with a small group and that sometimes it feels like we need to have thousands of people in the street to get our message across. 
but actually it's a lot harder to deliver a targeted specific narrative with a mass mobilization or thousands of people because often the image that comes out of that that's on the front page of the paper on social media is just a photo of a crowd, right? And obviously there's huge um, change that has come from mass protests as we can see from the uprising this summer. Um, but in addition to that, we wanna think about how we're doing targeted narrative um, in addition to these mass mobilizations, bringing targeted narrative to those mass mobilizations. So I'll work with groups who um, have five young people who wanna take action. And then if, if they can take a, a photo that's super powerful and has a clear slogan on their sign that speaks to the current narrative in the public and shows, you know, we talk a lot about how young people have moral authority um, about what's happening right now with climate change. And if they can communicate that um, it doesn't actually need a large group. And if, you're, if your message is clear, that's actually going to get you a lot further in getting your narrative um, to build power than if you have a really large group that isn't as clear on the specifics narrative that you're trying to put forward. So I would say it really isn't about size, but about thinking about what's the specific messaging that you're trying to get forward and how are you using your visuals to communicate that as clearly as possible and then having that amplified by lots of other people um, with an aligned narrative and messaging. Nice, yeah, that's great. Um, Elisa, do you have anything to add to that as well? Yeah, I was gonna add that um, we're definitely a small nonprofit, very small budget, but there's still a number of folks involved, um, not just in the Boston area, but across the country, um, and how we kind of work together virtually for years now, before COVID, um, to create impactful work, to think of how we can engage communities, not just in Boston, but beyond, um, to think of how our work can translate in Boston and in New York and Nebraska and everywhere else um, that our company members are so that um, we're spreading change um, and hopefully culture. That's great. Yeah, thank you guys both. Uh, I'm also just curious, just as sort of maybe a final question for both of you guys, for me at least, uh, would there be anything that you'd want to see the arts community at large add to our table or expand on an advocacy work as a whole sector? And I don't know, do we want to start with Nina again, maybe? Sure. Um, yeah, well, I think, you know, it was really interesting to hear from our earlier panelists, because I think like Emily's pointing out the difference between advocating for support for the arts and using arts within advocacy. And I think they're both really important. And sometimes we see those as an either or, and I think that's, there's just, there doesn't have to be a competition between those things and we can make both happen. But in terms of using arts for advocacy, um, yeah, I really do think thinking about how we communicate our message in a way that reaches the audiences that we wanna reach. And one thing we think about a lot in Sunrise is that the climate movement has historically um, been for middle class white people and owning class white people and has had really racist history and racist focus. And Sunrise has really has a long way to go, but is working with other frontline climate justice organizations to really think about how are you bringing in BIPOC leaders, um, working class leaders and people from frontline communities who are facing the harshest effects of climate change. And one of the ways we can do that is by making our messaging and our movement actually talk about the reality of our communities and not just about what's happening to the polar bears or what's happening to our national parks. So what's happening in our cities, like cities are not um, exempt from climate change. It's not just nature, right? So one thing we really think about is how do the visuals um, of our movement and the visuals we're putting out to explain these ideas like the Green New Deal, which can feel really confusing and dense to people, how can they talk about real people and real communities and not just about nature? So some, a lot of times, if you Google like climate change or Green New Deal, a lot of the imagery is gonna be windmills and solar panels and rolling green hills with no people in them. And how do we create imagery about um, climate justice and about the Green New Deal and what that could look like um, that actually talks about people and cities and communities and you know people all over the country who live very different experiences, but all of us want jobs and healthcare and communities that are set up to actually protect people and to actually take care of each other. So thinking about how artists can create imagery that actually speaks to all the communities that we wanna reach and that we want to be included 
and not making visuals that actually unintentionally exclude people because they can't see themselves in those visions. That's great. That's really great. Yeah. So a lot of like personalizing the narratives and making sure that they're inclusive and equitable for everyone in the community. Yeah. Elise, did you have anything else to add with that as well? I was listening so intently. Could you mind just uh, repeating the question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just if you could speak a little bit to like if you had a wish list or if you had any like action items that you think that the art sector as advocate, advocates could be working on more or uh, adding to our, our larger bucket list of, of things that we want to accomplish. Yeah, I think um, the community as a whole could be more accessible. Um, even things like having captions on webinars and um, more uh, accessible components as far as having events in accessible buildings, et cetera. Um, and also seeing more um, disabled representation across sectors that aren't just disability specific. Um, and within the disability community as well, being a little more intersectional um, because it's really white. And so having more um, people of color, having more other um, multiply marginalized bodies across the sector that will help um, our art sector grow and become um, a better force and um, creating social justice. Amazing, yeah, all of those things, yes, like absorb, let's absorb them into our bubble of, of our practices. I, I love that answer, so thank you so much. And Emily, I don't know if you had any more questions or if how we're doing on time here, but looking through the chat as well. I, I'm going to uh, use executive privilege and ask Nina if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit. You mentioned um, imagining. Uh, it, it's, I'm, I'm, forgive me, it was a, a minute ago, but it, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about. Is like, what are there are a couple of things that the creative and cultural community can do really well, and one of them is visioning and imagining what our future can look like, and then also through the humanities, helping us reflect on our past so we do better. And so, Nina, you mentioned just a second ago about some of your work um, about that imagining piece, and I'd, I'd love if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit more about that. Yeah, thanks for that question. I want to drop a link, and I don't know how many people have seen this, and don't watch it now, but watch it after um, this webinar. Um, this is a beautiful piece of art by Molly um, Crabtree, and um, she is an artist based in New York City who made this video um, with Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and Naomi Klein about visioning the future with the Green New Deal. And I actually think it's one of the best examples we have of um, a video and gorgeous paintings that are part of this video that really imagine what it could look like in the future if we actually work to um, clean up the damage of climate change and listen to indigenous um, leaders in our communities and give everybody a meaningful job who wants one and other things like that that the Green New Deal is about. And um, yeah, like I said before, I think it's really hard for people to picture what it could look like to have people-centered policies that addresses racism and disability oppression, like Elise has been so eloquently talking about, and addressing you know, classism and other issues that our communities are facing. And so sometimes when you ask people to advocate for these issues, we're so discouraged about what's actually possible that it's hard for us to picture how the world could be different. And so I think one of the biggest things that artists can do, which has always been true in you know, the history of our world is that artists can give us a picture of what could be possible and help people be hopeful and dream about an alternate reality and actually lead us towards advocating for that. Because once we can picture it, it's so much easier to actually push for it. So I think making more art that looks like this, where it's actually visioning a future of our community that could be different. And again, not just having imagery that's like a rolling hill with a windmill on it, um, which doesn't actually help you picture what your community will look like if we solve climate change and set up our communities to support each other, um, you know, really human-centered communities. I think this is the type of art that is really necessary for people to be able to picture what that could look like and step towards doing more advocacy work for that reality. 
And and I get and my thank you, Nina. And I wanted to ask Elise, like in your choreography, do you consider those those pieces of the work? I think I one of the things that um, really got me excited about you joining on this call is I've heard you talk about why you founded Abilities Dance, and um, you know it 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 seems to me that your whole you know that whole effort is about imagining a different reality for dancers and for the disability community but i'd love to hear a little bit more about your perspective on that um my perspective on just the creating the work or the like the imagining a different path forward and and sort of demanding a different path forward to be perfectly honest Got it. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to be able to um, highlight within the work, um, not just really great dance and really great music, but the, also the access points we have. Um, that's just not included as far as like audio descriptions embedded in the work for blind low vision audiences. And knowing that that was vetted by a blind editor, um, so that someone from the community is um, seeing that work or um, captioning and all of these different access points that people just aren't used to um, so that they can start to think of how they can be more inclusive within their own organizations or within their own companies so that we can start reimagining that different world um, because it's time. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you both Nina and Elise for being here today. Um, if we, if you, if you all have the time to stay on, I want to just um, give a couple of things to think about um, and then open up to a larger discussion if everyone feels okay about that. Nick and Michael, if you can join us with that too, that'd be fantastic. So gee, if you wouldn't mind sharing um, slide 13. So what I wanna talk a little bit about is, is you've heard from a number of different perspectives and I would say I consider them experts in thinking about this intersection of art and activism and being a leader in the creative sector and being an advocate. Um, and there are a couple of things that you can do right now. And then there are a couple of questions that I have to sort of um, for you to think about or, or meditate on. So, um, so think of this as a little bit of a shopping or a laundry or to-do list. So. Um, the election isn't over yet, right? Even though we're seeing record turnout, in fact, um, this just made me so excited. So yesterday, we are now, uh, Mass Inc. polling um, went through the, the early voting um, records, and we are now at almost 40% of voting participation compared to 2016's complete election. So not just like where we were before before election day, but overall we're all, we're at about like 40%. That's unbelievable. It's about 1.3 million votes have been cast already. But it's still happening, right? So there's still work to be done. Um, and tomorrow is actually the deadline to register to vote in the November 3rd election. So if you haven't yet registered to vote, please be sure to do that. Um, you can also, you may be asking yourself, am I registered to vote? Don't worry, we have an answer to that question for you. Um, and you, there's a link, there should be a link coming. Yep, there's a link already in the chat box where you can check your voter, your voter registration status. And when you do that, you will also see who is on your ballot. And so this goes to another point. Oftentimes, and I think particularly in this election cycle, there has been such a strong focus on the presidential election. But the reality is, is that there are a number of other folks running for office and a number of different candidates who are um, running for office that you'll see on your ballot. And every single race matters. Um, the folks that enforce policies, that make choices for you in your, in your town or your city, some of those folks are on the ballot this year. And before you go into the voting, voting booth and have that moment of, huh, I don't actually know what the registrar does for our town, take a look and see who's running and check out their platforms because that's part of this, this creating the vote. Um, there are also going to be some upcoming phone banking opportunities that Create the Vote will be sharing with you, and we hope you'll take part in that. Those phone banks are to encourage folks to vote um, and to make their voting plans. 
Then you see this question, who are your five? So um, Nina, you mentioned, and you're talking a lot about how it's not just about um, packing the Boston Common with people. Oftentimes it's about who are the five people that you're gonna reach out to and talk to about this election and make sure that they have a voting plan, that they've taken a look at their, their provisional ballot before they've gotten into the voting booth. Then I want to talk a little bit, and this is something that Michael has been, Michael was talking about earlier, is getting to know your elected officials. So um, I made I made the bold move to radically change my Twitter account a couple of years ago, and now I think I follow every state legislator who has a Twitter account. And the fact of the matter is, is through that, I know so much more about what they care about, what their community's priorities are, and sometimes I know when they're planning on having a virtual virtual office hour or an in-person meetup, though those in-person meetups aren't happening quite as much right now. So I would encourage you all to take a look. And if you are on social media, use that as a way to engage with your elected officials and get to know them and their policies a little bit better. You should also think about um, seeing if your elected official is having a virtual office hour or meetup hour. That is, I think, again, this piece, Michael, you were talking about that it only takes four or five calls to get it moved up the chain. I would hazard a guess that very rarely when a legislator or an elected official offers open office hours, are they getting a lot of questions or a lot of folks asking about their um, arts and cultural policy plans? <laughs> and so that's another place where you can make a direct impact that doesn't have anything to do with an election cycle. That's almost all the time, right? And then the other piece is get to know their staff. So the, the secret, my magical secret is that um, when I can, I love to talk to staffers because staffers are oftentimes the folks that have a little bit more bandwidth to talk with me. And they're the folks that that legislator turns to in a quick moment to say, I need you to give me the 60 second brief on this issue. What do I need to know? And so you want to be the person who's helping that staffer know what that brief should be. Um, and that's not always easy to find, right? There's not a public directory of who's on everyone's legislative staff. But if you're already marking your calendar to do reasonable, like regular check-ins, you slowly but surely are going to know who their scheduler are, who their chief of staff is, who their budget policy analyst might be. And those are the folks that you want to talk to and be in conversation with. Then I want to just say, let's talk a little about getting involved in the process. So as I mentioned, Mass Creative is going to do its legislative agenda setting process. And we're looking to do a sort of a big input piece of this work. Um, and hearing from you about where you think we should prioritize the policies and the law and the bills that we're going to go after. The reality is we can't get nearly everything that we want accomplished in one legislative session. So we're going to have to make some choices and you're going to help us make those choices. So please, as that comes along, please help us um, and engage in that process. Then calls to your elected officials. So um, I, I, another piece is, is that uh, I am now hearing from staff that and legislators that they can sniff out sort of a canned advocacy email a mile away. And while that is very helpful, and I would please encourage you to continue to fill out and use our email forms, you could take a couple of moments and personalize that message. There, the you know When we have a template out, it kind of gives you the bare bones, but adding your story matters. Changing the subject line also matters, right? Um, and then if you want to take the extra five minutes, instead of sending the email, pick up the phone and call, or um, follow up with a call or follow up with a second email after you've sent that email. That kind of personalized, individualized um, outreach does make a difference. And then I asked the question, what's happening in your city and town? Um, about a year ago, I was talking to an arts advocate and they said, what if we tried to get artists on every single appointment board and commission for every city and town in Massachusetts? And while I don't think we'll be able to do quite that, there are many ways to participate and engage with your city and local governments. And that's a that's actually part of this larger effort, right? We've seen how as more states, excuse me, as more cities and towns have embraced things like 
cultural um, creative place keeping, um, thinking about supporting their arts and cultural organizations through a municipal match to their MCC dollars, that that has bubbled up and it's made um, a it's made an impact with state lawmakers. So your work in thinking about how you're um, engaging on the hyper-local local level, as well as the state and then the federal letter level does matter. So there's, those are some questions to meditate on and to do's that you can do right now. But I wanna open it back up in the remaining time that we have to sort of a, just a further conversation. So who's got a question or alternately, who's got a really exciting sort of creative advocacy project that you want to share with the rest of us? Um, I think this is the place where we all can get inspired by each other's work and how we're thinking about it. And my dog, Babe, desperately wants to share her advocacy project. So I'm going to go on mute for just a second. But um, G, if you would stop sharing the screen and maybe Elena, would you moderate the conversation? Yeah, folks. So if anybody has any questions or things to add, you're welcome to uh, put it in the chat or you're welcome to actually uh if you want to take a second quickly to just unmute and just kind of speak to all of us i feel like that would be really nice so i'll just give a second for folks to get their voices in if you have anything but yeah any projects any questions anything to respond to about our panelists as well to what we've been talking about uh, in regards to advocacy I'll, I'll say just one quick thing if yeah, thanks. Uh, I can. Uh, Hubert Hope, Dinosaur and Next Music Ensemble, a composer, a musician, also arts administrator. Uh, so uh, our, our, our ensemble has been doing a number of projects that are meant to uh, be very socially engaging and very topical, uh, pro, uh, immigration rights, uh, composers who have had visas denied, uh, featuring their music, et cetera. Uh, but I think what I and others in our community have been doing as a next step is to make that connection between what our art is saying and actual action engagement items that our audiences can then provide. So um, there's a very good article that was published in a blog that is very active in our subdiscipline. Uh, the blog is called I Care If You Listen, and I'll put it in the chat window and you can read through it. And it has some very good ideas for active engagement, uh, linking the art to the actual engagement that, that, concert go that concert goers can then take action after attending your event. Thank you. Thank you for this call. Really yeah, important. thank you. And thanks for popping that in the chat in advance. Um, anybody else had anything to add or? Hop in there about anything that you're up to with your organizations or as an individual too. Let's see. Okay, I have another question from Joan. I see how might retired artists and art teachers get involved? After having been very active as a teacher and museum professional, I find myself now that I'm retired, how can I be more involved? That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure. Emily, do you have anything to add about that? Yes, um, I do, but I also would love to hear from our panelists about yeah. their perspective on this too. But I, I would say that, um, you know, right, um, there are lots of different ways, right? And I think that oftentimes we think that we have to do it just one way or that um, it, it can only happen on after or off hours. But I'm thinking about as an arts educator, like, are you thinking about attending your school committee meetings? Um, or following what's happening in your school committee and advocating and, and making sure that folks know about that. The other thing is linking into um, uh, arts and cultural advocacy, arts education advocacy groups that are in your city or town. So a lot of groups, there's a lot of parent booster associations, and those are the folks who are probably on the front lines of thinking about that, right? Because it's their kids in the program that they that they really want to see to um, receive that education, and that's another way to engage. Arts Learning, which is an arts education advocacy group, actually has a, is building a directory of all of the parent support groups in Massachusetts, um, slowly but surely. So they're doing it through like, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, through a survey that they're sending out to folks and asking people to self-identify. But through that, you might find another way to engage on that issue. And then again, I would, I would heartily stress 
you are a constituent of many elected officials. And if you have the time and the energy to talk to them about your experience with the power that arts and culture has given to young people or to community members as, you're, as you've worked in that space, um, making sure you're telling those stories is really powerful. But I am gonna stop talking and see what other folks think about that on the panel. I think the only thing that I would add is that um, often you, um, if you're retired, you just have more time. Obviously there's lots of, I'm sure things that you're working on, but um, I think a lot of us feel so much pressure with our jobs and other advocacy work or other work we're doing, taking care of families that it's just really hard to find time. So I think some of the things that Emily and others were talking about, like building those relationships with state legis legislatures, um, you have more time to do that possibly. And also as someone who's been, you know, in done this work for decades, you really have the experience to talk about how meaningful the work is and advocate for people who are in those professions now um, and artists who are out on the street doing advocacy work where you can see how powerful it is and be the one to communicate that to the state legislature. So yeah, I would just add that you're just really well positioned to talk about how important this work is from your experience and well positioned in terms of time to be able to hold some of those deeper relationships with the legislature. I'd also add um, figuring out what causes really speak to you, potentially joining boards of nonprofits that are doing that work and volunteering um, your time and energies to help um, the really hardworking, especially hardworking small nonprofits continue to do what they do. Um, and supporting in that way. And then always just like educating yourself on um, the different causes, the different communities, how you can best be welcoming and inclusive um, to everyone. That's great. Yeah, thank you so much for both of you. And Nick, did you have anything to add to, add to that? The answer doesn't have to be yes, but. Yeah, um, I think it, uh, get involved with your local cultural councils. I think all our MCC folks here would support that. Um, that, that, and that's a way to really also understand everything that's going on in your local community while helping to figure out um, what should be supported. Agreed with that, yeah, that's great too. I mean, we, I know we only have um, any, any final thoughts from any of our panelists as well too. I just wanna make sure that we keep hearing from you guys in these final moments, but feel free to jump in as well, Emily. It's been so great to talk to all of you and just, you know, hear all these different perspectives because there's so much, so many pieces to this puzzle that I think it can often get overwhelming, but I think you've all done such a great job of boiling it down to some really clear action steps that we can all take as, as different types of people. So that's really super, super great. I just want to say, uh, uh, wrap up and say thank you to our panelists, to Nick and Michael and Nina and Elise for giving your time and sharing your emotional and intellectual labor. Um, it is, it's very, it means a great deal to me and it means a great deal to the mass creative um, team that you're willing to partner with us in this conversation. I also want to thank um, Attorney General Maura Healy for her opening greetings and remarks. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's great to see elected officials who don't necessarily have arts and culture within their purview understand and make the connections between how arts and culture are part of a healthy, connected, and equitable and just Massachusetts. And so I'm glad that Attorney General Maura Healy is part of that work with all of us. And then finally, I want to thank all of you for joining us for an hour and a half through some technical difficulties. Um, a leaf blower outside my window, a truck honking or a trolley behind us. Um, in these moments where we are um, connecting over video it's often it can feel tough but um i get such power and energy and i keep moving forward thanks to the fact that i know that all of you are in this work with us so i want to thank you for your energy and your time today um, and for all of our collective advocacy efforts moving forward um, we've got a long road to go but we are making some progress and when we work together um, we can make even more so thank you so much and have a great afternoon and a wonderful weekend all thanks <laughs>